Oh my god! Oh my god, I am <laughs> absolutely in shock, complete shock. This is like unbelievable. Is this real? I can't believe someone sent me an Atari Falcon. Can you believe it? I cannot believe it. I am in absolute shock. I, I, I don't know what to say. I am lost for words. I have spent the last 20 minutes just like literally dancing around and in a maze. I'm just shocked. I'm, I can't believe it. I cannot believe someone would be... Well, I, 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 I'm lost. I'm lost for words. I can't believe someone would have a Falcon and then... I just, I am literally lost for words. I can't believe someone would send me a Falcon. The Atari Falcon is like the flagship Atari product. This was like, I think, the final computer in their range. Originally, it was going to go into a shell that looks very much like the PS2, but Atari, I think it was, uh, was it Atari Germany? I think it was. So there was one particular region that kind of took ownership of it and said, no, we're going to try to aim this at, uh, you know, a follow on from the. ST range, so this is why it's ended up looking exactly like an Atari ST here with the same case and the keyboard layout Although the keys are a really nice uh, shade of brown here. I suspect this may have been retro bright or something It's got that appearance. Can you see it looks a bit faded in places? But it's not the end of the world and when you retro bright something like this if it doesn't go as according to plan You could literally just put it in some direct sunlight and from my experience you tend to find it just starts to go back to a, a more normal looking colour um, but this is this is I, I, I just don't know what to say this is amazing this is amazing I cut myself off before the value of these things is crazy absolutely crazy you'll uh, spend a uh, thousand pounds upwards on uh, I, I can't believe it a thousand pounds upwards for something like this uh, and the other thing is this one's pretty well kitted out as well um, I don't know what to say I, 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 hats off I don't know what to say, <laughs> seriously. Hats off to the chap that has sent me this. I'll stick his name up here, and uh, I'm going to go and uh, speak to him a bit more on Twitter later to find out a little bit about himself. I don't even know his first name, for one thing, which is... I, I just feel so uh, indebted. This is just incredible. Uh, at the very, very least, I'm going to uh, suggest that anything he's repairing, like ever, just send it to me, and I'll sort it out. No problems at all. This is amazing, absolutely amazing. N I never thought I would ever own a Falcon. I watched a video by Nostalgia Nerd on the Falcon, uh, you know, and I was drooling watching it, thinking, wow, those are so rare, you know, how could he afford that? It's incredible. He must be doing well to be able to spend so much money on something like a Falcon. Um, because, when they, like I say, they do come up, they're between 1000 and £2,000. I literally just had the camera running there for about two minutes while I was just staring at this thing, wondering what to say, because I, I, I am lost for words. I am absolutely lost for words. Uh, now, this uh, is uh, described as faulty. You know, there are an issue or two or more with this. Um, and as I say, you know, yeah, the case is not perfect, but you know what? I just love it. I love it already. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and even the badge is a little bit faded. It, it, I'm kind of wondering if someone's either retro this or bleached it or something, because these letters look a bit of a funny colour. So, uh, and the keys, I'm sure this would be darker than this, but you know what, I am, uh, I'm not fussed in the slightest at all. I know that once I clean this up and uh, give it a little bit of love, it's, uh, it's going to come out like new. The other thing you could do, uh, and I'm not 100% sure until I get in there, you could always swap the shell. If the shell was damaged in any kind of way, um, you could swap it with one from an STE, I think, because just looking at the standoffs underneath the points where the screws are it looks just to me like they've used the original shell uh, and you can get new badges as well i saw some of those a while back on ebay so there's something worth pointing out here you can see here the power supply is not there and we've got this cable coming out here with some leds and switches and the reason being it has believe it or not this is another thing that again it's jaw dropping and uh, i am just absolutely indebted to this guy seriously it has a ct 60e i think in there which is an 060 accelerator so in order to power that ct60 board you need 3.3 volt supply and you need eight amps even if you were to step the voltages down from here, this cannot provide anywhere near enough power to get that 8 amps. 
um, but he's kindly included this power supply. So the, the issue I've got at the moment is, well, A, I know there's a fault with this. I'll stick a, a little an image here overlaid on the screen so you can see how it was described as behaving. And I don't have a power supply that you need to plug into that cable that flies off. There's like a little uh, uh, connector. I don't know where it's gone now. Yeah, this connector here. I don't have anything to plug into that at the moment. So I'll order one of those, but the first thing I think we should do is, well, strip it down. Let's have a look inside, see if we can see anything uh, obvious, but remove the accelerator, find some way of reverting it so that it uses the onboard 030, because this is what this contains, hence Falcon 030. It's got a 68030 processor. Fit this power supply, measure the voltages perhaps, uh, make sure we're okay on that side, because I don't think there's anything wrong with this, but these should be recapped from time to time. Uh, and actually, when I approached uh, Exos over on the uh, Ex on his forum there, I'll post some links down below, uh, about the common issues with Falcons, because he's the good source of knowledge, he, he's an expert, an absolute expert at all the Atari products and things, uh, mainly all the ST family of computers. Lots of spares and things on his website, right down to custom chips and things. Uh, and his own power supplies as well, as I've mentioned in the past. So I thought it was a good idea to speak to him to get his input and his opinion. Uh, but he does have quite a wealth of uh, knowledge uh, base on his forum and uh, articles on his, uh, you know, his blog there on his website. So I read into uh, some of that stuff and had a look around and worked out what I think I need to do. So, as I say, the first thing is get this power supply back in. We need to remove the 060 board. Enable the 030 on board and uh, also test the RAM. Now, in advance, I ordered a RAM module myself. Um, I could have saved some money here. I didn't need this, which uh, it's just one of these things. I'm so I get so eager. I, mean, I didn't even know this was going to arrive. To be honest, so it was a gamble. But uh, I thought, well, I can use a 16 meg SIM, and these memory expansions are not very expensive. But I think as things transpire, this has got a RAM board, but he's also provided the original RAM board, so that's uh, going to be cool to test that as well. I don't know whether that's 1 meg or 4 meg. You can see here it says 1 slash 4. Uh, they had a module here that was, uh, you know, um, configurable at factory. So I, I guess you just had a different uh, size of chips on there, and a, I don't know, a jumper pad or something joined there. So we'll have a look at that, we'll test that. Um, but this, of course, assumes we can get this booting, because it is not booting at the moment. The other thing I ordered from Exos, which I've wanted for a while, and again, is super cheap. I think these are about £18 or something. It's a diagnostics cartridge, so it's not got a shell like my existing ST diagnostics cartridge. But uh, if I just put the power supply down, you can see here you've got lots of uh, different configuration options. ST, STE, Mega STE, TT, 030, so that is how this is set at the moment and I think because I ordered this after I'd spoken to Exos he's kindly put this in the 030 mode I guess he gathered that I was uh, going to use it for that uh, what's that one there Y-A-A-R-T I'm not sure there's a few different ones there Gembench ah so you can perhaps uh, you know you can change uh, what software you run um, but anyway that's hopefully should come in handy but it might not boot at all with this because of the way it's behaving you know as you saw that screenshot looks like something's crashing very wrong somewhere so i've been so excited to get inside this i've literally removed all the screws already you don't even have to watch me unscrew them uh, yeah so all of the screws are in the same place as i think that you would have on uh, an st or an ste there's a few different mounts here that perhaps don't exist on those boards i don't know um, I, I've removed the screws on the inside as well, actually, as you'll find out in a second. So looking around the back here, you can see a DSP connector here for I.O., I guess. Not sure how easy it would be to source one of those connectors, actually, because it's the high D type, isn't it? But it's uh, it's quite wide. It's like, I don't know, 30-odd pins or something. Um, headphone, jack stereo, microphone, SCSI. Uh, monitor that's different from the ST and STE. He sent me an adapter. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, RF modulator, printer, modem. That's serial port, isn't it? Uh, LAN, which is interesting, and then obviously your power supply. You know, you normally have your AEC mains input socket here, and the power switch and a reset switch. On the side, in uh, ST series fashion, 
we've got MIDI out, MIDI in, the cartridge port looks identical to the one on the STF and uh, STFM etc STE and the analog joystick ports again looks identical to what you get on the STE and the Jaguar, Jaguar pads will work in there I think uh, I just can't get over how great this is, this is just amazing, I mean look at this, this nice slab of 060 here and it's uh, even got uh, what looks like to be a DIM or something in there, memory module, we've got a Pico power supply there at the back I think, so this is our little mini ATX Pico power supply to power this. What are all these for? Yeah, yeah these are the cable, this is the cable that comes off the back here, so, and there's some more positions there for other things, so, so I'm not sure what what, I don't know much about this. I don't even know whether this is going to work or not. This may have a fault. I briefly unscrewed the one of the screws from here, so I need to finish taking that out. But I did unscrew the four screws from underneath the GoTech here, so we can just lift that and have a look. So we've got a chip socketed here. I'm not sure what that is. Not sure what anything is really. I'm going to need to look a lot of this stuff up. So quad flat pack there. A little quad flat pack. Uh, is that a BIOS or something? A ROM? kind of looks like it, might not be, a um, little logic IC there, a little ASIC, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure what, so yeah, we might want to recap uh, this, I'm not sure, we'll certainly be checking things with the ESR meter, so just lifting the keyboard up here, you can see it's, uh, it looks identical to an STFM uh, and an STE keyboard, there are more pins at the top of that connector there than the actual plug, let's just unplug it, yeah, so you can see it's a bit shorter, it's uh, bottom aligned there, it's keyed, can you see that, that little key thing there? So that corresponds with a gap, uh, just like it does on the ST uh, FM keyboard and stuff. So yeah, we've got a screw missing there, someone might have been in this to resolder the joystick ports at some point, so I'll need to find a replacement for that. Uh, all the other screws look there I think, but yeah, someone's definitely been in this, which doesn't surprise me, because if you saw my... Uh, STFM repair video recently, uh, you'll know that that's a super common issue. It's, uh, it happens uh, so often uh, that the joystick port's breaking, uh, and sometimes the keys need uh, cleaning up as well. So, yeah, you can see it's a little bit discoloured. Would they have been a dark grey? I don't know. Uh, some of the ones I've looked at look more browny, if I'm honest. So, I'd be interested to know. Let me know your thoughts there. Were there different revisions of this, or has this been retro or something? Yeah, on first inspection there, you might be horrified and go, Oh my god, corrosion! But uh, let me just uh, show you something, if I can find it. Um, yeah, here's the new one that I got from Exos. <laughs> so, the one thing I would say is, the, the products he produces are amazing, and the prices, you know, the, it's about price point here. The prices are very, very cheap for something like this. I think this, uh, well, I think they are. I think it was about 20-odd 20, 20 quid, maybe 30 quid, I'm not sure. Um, what I would say to Exos is spend an extra two minutes cleaning these uh, connectors up with IPA and uh, increase the price by a pound. I think most people would be very happy to see this when it's nice and shiny and it looks nice, but when you look at it like that, it's uh, a bit off-putting, isn't it, really? But yeah, I say I'm not. I'm not disrespecting XLC. He does a fantastic job. These products are amazing. But why not just spend one minute cleaning that with an IPA and a toothbrush, or put it in an ultrasonic uh, cleaner or something uh, when you do a batch at once, and then just increase the price by a pound or something. Nobody's perfect. M myself uh, more than anybody else, <laughs> in fact. So I'm not sure if I pointed out on the underside there is a, a fan uh, vent here. So this fan looks a bit caked, full of dust, look, but it's also chopped off. I'm not sure where that goes, so we're going to need to do something with that. Maybe even replace this fan. So these are a common source of failure. It's a real-time clock that holds some CMOS settings, I think. I'm not sure if that needs replacing, has been replaced at some point in the recent past. I've got no idea. So that might be, uh, I don't know, a future part to this series. I don't really know. Until we get this up and running, we won't know. So let's uh, try and get this uh, board off. Now it looks like we've got a push connector here, and you can't quite see it, a push connector here. Um, so I think, in theory, if we just carefully lift this, I don't know, it feels like it doesn't want to come up. I have seen some motherboard photos, there you go, that's coming off there, let's just see if we can lift it here as well. 
yeah I've seen photos of this but to be honest it's very hard to find any information well it was from my experience uh, like you know detailed photos guides that talk about jumpers or connectors on the board there's, there's hardly anything out there so hopefully we'll improve that situation by me waffling about some of this stuff through this series here that's amazing what a giant board that is as well really nicely made look I think from uh, experience this this is like a, uh, a remake of the original CT60 series so I'm not sure if they use the same Xilinx chips here or something that's compatible because the firmware to update these is available online I just don't know whether you can use it on this um, again post your comments down below if you know um, we've got some buffer buffering going on here look that looks like a flash ROM uh, I think uh, some more uh, 74 type series chips there I think uh, somewhere on here is going to be uh, I was going to say a uh, switching regulator or something but I don't think there is I think this may do it this may output or inject 3.3 you know 3.3 volt supply rail to the board because I think the 060 needs 3.3 volts doesn't it but that's a, a thing of beauty that board just on its own um, it's amazing I hope we can get that working but you know what I I'm just going to be so happy just to get the Falcon up and running if this doesn't work and I can't get the 060 running it isn't the end of the world uh, and again just I am lost for words the fact that he's left this on here these are really hard to get hold of because um, I think that's a full 060 RC50 that is just a dream come true on its own I think I'd be uh, gobsmacked and uh, you know lost for words if someone just sent me this <laughs> if I'm honest it's too good to be true this I I'm sure I'm imagining this whole thing this is my imagination am I really doing a video here so that uh, PCB was connected between here the power uh, area and it went right down here right out here and the other end of it was on the connector you can't quite see just down here next to the CPU now I thought this was the CPU but it's got a really weird part number on it that SC414230 FE16 I'm not sure that is the CPU I, I just thought it was I don't know what made me think it was it looks like an you know, 030 to me um, maybe it's just got a different part number on it maybe there's something bespoke about the CPU but it, that looks like the 030 and then we've got a large Atari part number here uh, I think one of these chips is called Vidalizer or something like that and Combell there's two, two different chips of Videl and a Combell, I think. And one of the things that worried me when I looked at the schematics in advance, we've got a couple of uh, like PLDs here, you know, like PALs or GALs. So, yeah, they've got Atari part numbers on. You could swap them with, uh, you know, and reprogram them up. I kindly got the uh, JEDEX for these from uh, James over at Retro HQ, actually. Thank you very much for that, James. Uh, in advance just in case we needed to get a new chip and program it up the interesting thing is I don't know if you can see this we've got like a blob of solder here and a blob of solder there so some kind of modification has gone on here in the past is that going to be related to this I'm not sure but I will certainly inspect the board a bit more thoroughly in a minute so I think the solder points on here that I showed you a minute ago after getting the board out and having an inspection on both sides we can see we've got a resistor missing here and then this has been soldered but there's a cut in the trace here so I figure what has gone on here someone's tried to do a clock mod to this to clean up the clocks uh, I'll perhaps talk about that a bit more later once I've done a bit of research but I do remember from looking at Exos's uh, website a number of years back when I was looking at stuff to do the Falcon that he sold a little clock mod and in fact I saw that recently when I was on there seeing what other things he had uh, in advance of this arriving so the way you do that mod is you replace this chip here and this has got these solder points I think someone's done some sort of mod or something in the past it's been reverted but these need putting back in place the other thing I still need to do is work out how to disable the expansion slot and re-enable the onboard CPU there's a jumper or something you connect somewhere I read about it I don't know where it is so anyway um, I've only got some 22 ohms that 33 ohm is okay um, but we need to fix the trace I'm just gonna fit a 22 there while I order a 33 and we'll just see 
if that makes any difference to the behaviour. So in order to get the original 030 on board, which I think is this, it might not be, uh, it could be further into the board. Let's just assume it is the 030, let's assume there is an 030 on here, because my, uh, well everything I've read makes me think there is an onboard one. Um, you've got to enable that with a jumper, and when you fit the uh, CT60, as this had, you remove the jumper. Now, it took me ages trying to work this out. I went everywhere on the net trying to see a photo of where you stick this jumper. I can't find anything. It's like I say, there's just hardly any information at all. I'm sure if you got the service, the, the owner's manual or something, it would be in there. I've just tilted that over. You can see here it says W11, and there's like a silk screen of a little thing like a goal post thing now i checked everywhere else around the board i couldn't see anything else that looked like that so i thought well i know from prior, prior experience that w something is usually a, a jumper it's usually either something you solder or something you remove or you know like so i've got a jumper here now i'm taking a gamble with this i think i think that goes there it seems a bit crazy, but I think that that is what W11 is designating there, because it is pointing to those two pins. And every other type of connector like that has not got anything like that on it. Um, so that, I think, should disable the slot, if you like, re-enable the 030 on board. So the only other thing I think we need to do is get this power supply in and uh, try and power it up. Now, I've got an adapter, which I'll show you later for the video. But I want to use the RF initially, just because I've not got a monitor nearby or anything like that, and I've not got a cable to connect it to the TV, but I have ordered a cable. So let's plug the power supply in here. This is still partially screwed in, by the way. So just measuring the voltages here, I'm on the uh, red wire and uh, between a black. You can see we've got 5 volts, and if I measure one of the 12 volt wires, those are 12 volts. We have 12 volts. So yeah, I would uh, obviously be recapping this. Uh, if I uh, plan on using that power supply with it, if we can't get the 060 work. Now I'm filming this bit at the end. There are a few things I forgot to point out when I was doing this uh, part of the video. You can see the voltage is marked here. Can you see that? Plus 5 volts, plus 12 volts. So the blue is the plus 12. You've got some grounds in the middle there. And then you've got some plus 5 connections. And it goes without saying, it's perhaps worth measuring the voltages here before you connect it to a board. You know, so just plug your AC lead, switch it on, and just see if you're getting 5 and 12. Sometimes you need a load on certain power supplies. I honestly can't remember whether this is one of them. But I was told in advance this power supply was fine. The only reason this had been removed was to do the CT60 mod. So that's one of the reasons why I, didn't, I wasn't sort of super careful in my approach there. Uh, it was one of the things I considered, but then I thought, I remember, he told me this power supply definitely, definitely works. So we're all connected up. I am on the uh, channel that the Atari ST uses. Uh, switch it on. And we got power then, hang on. Oh my god, it works. So let's switch it off. That, that's unbelievable. Uh, I am in shock. <laughs> I can't believe it, I can't believe it, this is just amazing, because this means that, uh, well we have it up and running already, um, it could indicate that the 060 board has got a fault, it could also just be that this thing down here was missing, you know this, this wire that we fixed and we added a resistor. So I think the next thing I need to do is get this booting some software, I haven't left it long enough to see if it will boot properly. So the Atari Falcon would have normally had a high density floppy drive here. One of the chips I pointed out earlier on, I thought was a ROM, it's actually the Ajax chip, and I uh, annotated that at that point in the video. Uh, so it's a high density floppy controller chip that, uh, and it supports obviously the high density floppy drive that would have gone in here. But this is a HXC. This is kind of prior to a GoTek, it's a floppy drive emulator. So you stick an SD card in the side here, at the moment this is blank, 
we'll go and set this up in a minute on the PC. You need to stick your, you know, your floppy images on here. So if you're familiar with emulators for the Atari ST, the floppy disk ROM format, you know, the file format of a, an image of a floppy disk, it's got a .st extension. Now, because this is uh, prior to the GoTech, it was an earlier, you know, an earlier version of the emulation hardware. You need to have those .st files converted to something native to this drive. I forget what the extension is. It's something like HFE, the .hfe file. So using the, the PC or a Mac, because the software is available for the Mac as well, you can convert those ST files to the format that this needs, copy those onto this. But you also need a configuration file in the root. The reason I already know that is because I have one of these drives already in my STFM. Sorry it's a bit flickery there, but you can just about see what I'm trying to show you. So this is the HXC floppy emulator software. This one's version 2.020.1. And I use this with my STFM. I've got a HXC floppy emulator in there. And it's um, it's a different model, but it's, uh, I think it's got the same uh, firmware and stuff. It works the same way. So there's an option here to load a floppy image. This is where you would go off and find uh, an .st file. So those are the disk images that you use with Atari ST. And once you've done that, you can then uh, click the export button. I haven't got one selected at the moment, it'll, it, and it will give you know give you a, fi a dialog file dialog to say where do you want to save it, and it uses the same file name that the original had, but instead of ending with .st, it ends with some other extension, something like .hxc or something like that, or .hfe, I think it might be. Um, the other thing you can do within here, as well as converting floppies that way, is the actual settings. There are two options here. This SD HXC floppy emulator settings and USB HXC floppy emulator settings and it's an SD card we've got here so I click on that um, I'm not sure if you can quite see that we've got like UI sound, headstep sound, scroll text speed, backlight standby you select the drive type up here at the moment it's on auto if I just uh, click that drop down you can see you've got different types here so you've got Amiga, Amiga HD, Atari ST, Atari ST HD so that's what we would click there so that's a ST HD um, and various other options and things here related to it but we can literally now you know sort of click save config file find our SD card and uh, save that CFG file to the root of the SD card so let's stick that SD card in. We've just got uh, Bubble Bobble on there at the moment, nothing else. And bear in mind, ST games may or may not work on the Falcon. Um, from factory, if you like. When I say from factory, I mean like the original versions of the games. Now there's a fantastic website I'll stick a link to down below. I think his name is Peter Putnik. I'm sorry if I've uh, mispronounced your name there or you know said it completely wrong. Um, yeah, he's an amazing guy, very talented hacker um, and programmer, uh, working with 68,000 processors, and in particular the ST family of computers. Uh, so he has, uh, as I say, a website where he's converted many games, most of the library of ST games, so they'll run on the uh, ST from an ultra sane hard disk, or from the Falcon, you know, they'll run the Falcon from hard disk. Um, so yeah, there are lots of games now, more games now available. That's Putin, isn't it? That is Putin. Wow. Yeah, well I can colour, but bear in mind, like I said, this uh, TV's not very well tuned in, I don't think. I could fine tune it in a minute. Uh, that is just a wonderful. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You can hear there, it's twice as fast as you would expect it to be. And I think... I think that's probably because the 030 is running at 16 megahertz on here, could be wrong. We'll check that. It might be 20. I don't know, but it's uh, certainly faster than it should play on an ST. But I'm amazed that's even loaded, to be honest. Yeah, so seeing if it'll boot off this now, I reset it. I'm just waiting to see what's going to happen. I don't know. Is it just going to come up with a dashboard, or will it try and boot off this card? No, it's not done anything there. We've got no hard drive, so let's switch it off. Now, I have to admit, having been in this a minute ago, one of the things I did is I disconnected this and then reconnected it. And I'm thinking I've connected this up the wrong way around. Um, it's certainly possible because um, I, I don't think I captured any footage when I first went in there. I was just so excited, I couldn't wait, if I'm honest, I couldn't wait. And one of the first things I did is I pulled this out, had a look underneath and put it back before we did any testing or anything 
and I, I can't help but wonder if I've flipped that around. Let's let's just try it the other way. Be sure it's definitely on there. Let's just switch it on. Oh, look at that! That is the original behaviour. Switch it off. Yeah, that is the original behaviour. I think, I hope I haven't killed it doing that. Let's just disconnect that. That looks very much like the screenshot I showed you at the beginning. Let me switch it off and on again. Yeah, phew. I <laughs> thought I'd killed it then for a minute. Oh, my heart's raced away. Hang on, let's just switch it off. So that has now got me thinking. I am thinking there is something wrong with this because it doesn't work either way, does it? doesn't work either way around. doesn't boot when we had it the way I had it, which I thought was the right way. It's cryptic here, because can you see this? You see it says 47 down there, right? So you would assume, okay, that's pin 47, so pin 1's up here. And there it says 43, so you're like, uh, hang on a minute, what's going on? Where's pin 1? Um, it may be that pin 1 starts here, and it goes 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, or some. I don't know, there could be some weird thing with these connectors when they have the power bit on the end there, but someone has definitely been doing some interesting tinkering around there in the past. Uh, and it's one of these that's, uh, yeah, not fantastic quality, although I'll be honest, I would like to get this working, because it supports two cards here, and it fits really nicely into this little enclosure. I, I do like that. So we'll see if we can do something with that. It might be a case of, you know, trimming these pins off here or something. And oh, hang on a minute, I wonder if this needs powering, thinking about this. You may need to, maybe this is why it's got wires here, you may need to power this. That might be why it's not working when I did the, what I think was the correct way around, when it's the wrong way around, it just kills the system. But then again, it could have been the wrong way around, when it's the right way around, it tries to boot off it, but it's not powered, or I don't know, something. But that is definitely something to do with the original faults. But I can't help but wonder if something went wrong with the CF card there, and then somebody removed the clock mod here thinking that was something to do with it. Didn't realise you need a resistor there and a bridge here. I mean, I'm guessing these are required. We, we're just assuming, aren't we? I've put these back on as I think they should be. They might not be. And there might be something else missing from somewhere else. So you know what? The clock side of the things here might not be 100% correct. What I do know is you can buy a really nice little clock PCB mod that cleans up clock signals from Exos. I think you take this chip out here, it plugs in, and then you do these mods. You remove that there, and you remove that there. Quite why they cut the trace here, I don't know. That is bizarre. Just remove it if it doesn't need to be there. Anyway, so uh, where do we go from here? This is working. This is just amazing. I'm going to start cleaning things up. I might just uh, get some IPA and cotton bud and clean around here a bit clean up this RAM board. Uh, I'll test my diagnostics cartridge, because we haven't done that yet, have we? Uh, show you that uh, here. See if we can tune the TV in a little bit better. We'll test test this RAM, as I say, and I'll test the other two RAM modules. Let's do that. Um, and just, I don't know, see where we are at that point, I think. Then maybe investigate uh, the uh, adapter here to see if we can get this working. So let's plug this in. Now, I should be wearing an ESD wrist strap, really. Uh, I will do when I get the board out in a bit. So, that's plugged in. We're just going to leave the ID disconnected for a moment, because I am sure, I think, after seeing what we've just seen, that maybe that was something to do with the original fault here. And let's uh, switch it on. Wow, that is working, isn't it? What's that red screen? Keep Oh, keyboard failed, it said, I think. Let's just switch it off. I'll connect the keyboard back up. I need to work out where to stick that fan as well. That, again, I am not sure about. I might just go see if I can... Uh, I've got the service manual, I think. The service manual. I've got the schematics, definitely, because I spent time examining those before. I said resetting IDE. Well, that's not there. We didn't get any red screens. That's good. Let's just see if I can tune this TV in a bit better, because at the moment it's... Uh, well, it's just not very good, is it? Wow, that looks so much better. Okay, so uh, I'm impressed with the uh, RF output on that. That's fantastic. So, uh, A, audio. So, very much like the ST test, isn't it? Low to high sweep. That is an ST audio test. That is just testing the audio that you get on the ST, the same chip there. 
because this has got like PCM audio and the DSP and all sorts. So that's not testing everything, is it? That's quite a limited test, that. Uh, there is a D, Diagnostics Field Service Menu. I wonder what that is. Anyway, let's do V for video. Uh, video monitor test space after each one. Switch monitors if screen doesn't change. This might be, oh yeah, plug in monitor. Hang on. Yeah, you need a specific monitor plugged in there. K, keyboard. Yeah, that is exactly the same test you see on uh, an ST, actually. Well, on this one, it's leaving the keys a different colour look, so you can see which ones you've pressed and which ones you haven't. Didn't do that when I did my version 4. Point whatever it was, diag car on my STFM. Anyway, the keyboard seems all right. Yeah, I think every key is good there. I don't think I've missed any other. So let's try D for Diagnostics Field Service Menu. Oh, there we go. So we've got loads of stuff now. We've got, uh, we've got D, RAM, uh, OS, ROM, MIDI, SCC, Serial Timing, Digital Audio, Floppy Disk, Printer, Real-Time Clock, Short Bullet. It has a blitter that runs at 16 megahertz in this, I think. Uh, versus the original one that uh, shipped, you know, it works with the ST and the STE. We've got analog audio as well, there's a lot of audio tests there. We've also got an IDE hard disk test there as well, that's quite cool. So let's try D for RAM, is it, or is it R? R for RAM, hang on. Oh, you've got to press return, that's interesting. R for RAM, testing RAM. Yeah, it does this towards the end of the test. Let's just see what happens. Maybe I just missed it. You know, is that like glitched out? Is that crashing? Or is that just testing the screen RAM? Oh yeah, there we go. Pass 40 meg. The D digital audio. Ah, oh, testing DSP SSI loopback. Yeah, so you need a loopback connected for that. That's uh, it's not going to work, is it? Uh, short blitz, is that G? Testing blitter, pass, that was very quick. Analog audio, uh, is that a B? I can't tell. Yeah, I'm not sure what you do there. Is this, when it says analog audio, does it mean an input? It could well be, because there's a mic connection on the back, isn't there? Yes, I can confirm that's audio in, can you see it? Sweet! Anyway, we've been through the majority of the tests I want to cover there, I think. I'm going to just uh, test the RAM again on those other two boards. and I won't show you, I'll just tell you the results and then we'll uh, move on to cleaning things up, I think, and looking at the IDE. Tested the original module there, it's passed and it's 4 meg, so that's great. I'm not sure if there's an idea way to get these off, but yeah, you can just literally just rock it one way or the other, very slightly like that. Pull it off, there we go. So I'll just test my other Exos module and we are done with the RAM. Uh, I'm just using a cotton bud with some IPA initially here and then I will uh, go over it with a toothbrush. Yeah, once this IPA evaporates to the bottom here you can see that looks uh, a lot better. And of course, when you get that much IPA, it's uh, it's going to flood onto the other side as well. Oh my god, what's happened to that sim there? It's just dirt or flux or something, can you see that? And around here, look, between those pins. So, yeah, um, I'm going to take that sim off and clean that sim with a toothbrush as well, actually. There we go, quick go with the toothbrush and you can see that's uh, looking pristine again. Yeah, connections on here are not that clean either, are they? Um, I mean, obviously, these are you know, there's no such thing as a brand new sim these days. Well, there are. You can make uh, if you can get the chips. You can uh, obviously make your own sims. Uh, but yeah, look, that's just a bit of oxidisation. It could be a bit cleaner. So even the original Atari one has got uh, you know some flux on this connector here. And look at this here, something has uh, got on there in the past. I don't know what. So we're going to be uh, redoing this work afterwards when a 33 ohm resistor arrives. At the moment we've got a 22 ohm. One of my cats is having a 
muddy at the moment. It's seen uh, an enemy cat outside somewhere on its territory. Because of course the cat owns the house. Yeah, I wouldn't leave the solder blobs on the side of that uh, resistor there that large anyway. Yeah, so that's looking a little bit better. But as I say, we're going to be going back in there later. Yeah, so that's not too bad. We'll tidy up further later. So the next thing I'm going to try is the compact flashcard that came with it in one of my own adapters here. And my pin one, I've marked this previously. There's a video on this, how to mod uh, one of these. This is actually the Amiga kit one, I think, actually. I oh, know it's not. It's one of the ones I modded. You remove the transistors there, and you cut a trace, and then uh, the LED and stuff works properly, and it doesn't cause any issue so anyway pin one is down here so let's just plug that into the cable assume that pin one is right and let's see what happens now so we're powered on and the cat's in the way as usual skip the memory test yeah it's loading look it's booting from the hard disk that is booting from the hard disk cd dvd something what's that errors uh yeah error unknown device it's looking for CD, it's also looking for something else, ISO 9660, oh, that's CD I think actually, is it? Wow, there we go, it's booted up, fantastic, no CD-ROM drives found, check the drives are connected. I need a mouse now. So I'll go and get my mouse in a minute, but I'm kind of more interested at this stage of what is wrong with the original IDE adapter. You can see an easy way to get this off is get a flat tool like this and just lever on one side, lever on the other. Eventually it comes off and you don't bend or damage any of the pins. So if we just pull that out. Now I'm tempted to try this on the other side here if we can. Because it may be that this is master and slave and for one reason or another it's... it's not even going to go in there is it? For one reason or another it's pointed the wrong way around. Oh it's got a thicker thing on one side and a thinner one on the other. So it goes upside down that one. Makes me wonder if that one goes the other way up actually, I don't know. Anyway, let's let's try that. I think pin one's down here. I think that's 43. And I think these things here are just additional pins. I think I think it goes this way. But the pins are all bent on it as well, so you never know, it could just be a bent pin thing. I think that's right. Let's just see what happens. So we've only got one LED on this side, we've got the red one and not the green one. Uh, skip the memory test. Yeah, look, that's booting. That is booting. So I think that that bottom slot is the secondary, actually. But I think the cable was round the wrong way to start with, which is why it was uh, one of the reasons why it wasn't booting properly at all. We had like garbage on the display. So I'm going to try and work out what is going on with that. I've switched the solder iron on. The first thing I'm going to do is, can you see these two pins are joined here? So we're going to desolder those uh, while I'm waiting for the uh, thing to heat up. Let's uh, just start straightening some of the edge pins here. You can see these ones here are particularly bent. So I'll just grab them, hang on, I can grab them with the thin nose pliers here. And just try and squeeze and straighten. Yeah, and it's the same, and it's the same down this end. Can you see? These are bent out of position. So we'll straighten those. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute when I've straightened these pins. So yeah, I mean, I could redo this myself. It's just a homemade, you know, bit of card or something. I cut this out here just so it's easy to get the connector on, and so that I could straighten the pins there. So those are all straight. You've got the odd one that sticks out a little bit longer there, which is uh, interesting. Actually, but it's just the way it's been soldered on. And of course you could just replace the connector. It's perhaps not as straight as it could be. But, yeah, it looks alright. Anyway, it's these end pins now. So let's just uh, bring the solder out. These ends two here, as I say, are soldered together. So let's just use, I'll try and use the solder pump on this if I can. And we'll just uh, heat those two pins there. I think they've been deliberately squashed together. So, it's anybody's guess as to why. So there we go, a lot straighter. There's still the odd one that doesn't look quite right. These ones are strained up and uh, they're not squashed together 
anymore and I have removed all the solder off them. So I'm going to go and test it like that in case this bridge here was something to do with the issue. But it might be that that's the jumper, because it talks about some jumpers here for Master Slave and I see them nowhere on this PCB, unless they're on the underside. So that might be, it might be nothing to do with this being a, a 40 odd, you know, 44 pin uh, or a 48 pin, however many there are, because there's one that's that large and then there's one with like an extra four pins for the power and ground and stuff, isn't there? And it might not be that. That might, there might be a deliberate gap here and then those might be the jumpers so I'm wondering if that was soldered to make this the master and that the slave now I've took that off, this might be the master, that might be the slave you never know but I think the cable was around the wrong way so I took this uh, PCB out, you can see it's a happy birthday card there I'm going to leave that, it's a bit of history but the other thing I did is just trim this edge here with a craft knife to round it off and to get it looking a bit tidier um, and then I discovered you can see on the silk screen a very small print there, we've got an A and a B. So that's what these are. This is not where you you know you get the wider connector where you get the power things on the end. It isn't. You have a jumper on the that side there that makes master slave, or you have it on the other side which makes master slave. Um, so there were a few issues. The cable was round the wrong way, the jumper was uh, well the car being left here wouldn't have worked, it needed to be in that slot, but I think the, the graphical corruptions were because of the cable the wrong way. Anyway, let's, uh, let's just get these back in. So, I can't which way around this went now. There were two of these things holding it in here. They just like twist like that. That's quite nice actually. And then there was one screw holding it on the other side. So we'll connect it up again with uh, pin one to the right hand side. That pin there is not as straight as it could be. It's been really, really bent in the past, so it's proven very difficult to straighten it. Anyway, that goes on OK. And we get the card in here. And if we just sort of set that over there. Yeah, that's looking more promising already. We've got the red light, not the green light. What was happening before is the green light was on constantly. So if we press space, there we go, it's booting. No worries. Fantastic. Of course, that doesn't mean I can get a second compact flash card for this and have two drives, which is really cool. Sweet. Right, I'm going to get a mouse and we'll have a look see what's on that hard disk. So the other thing I'm going to quickly do here is just carefully try and remove this uh, pile here. And clean off the solder off the corner legs of it because it just looks a mess. So yeah, the socket's okay there. Yeah, you can see you can see a big blob of solder there and a big blob of solder there. Yeah, so I've just uh, smoothed the edge there because there were just slight marks on there. But as you can see the socket's pristine and if I carefully show you the chip, this was the side where the solder blob was, you can see it looks normal now. Uh, and I cleaned this up with IPA as well, obviously got to make sure I get it the right way round. Pin one is just down here. Pin one notch is there. Uh, and I just used a solder braid with a tiny bit of flux, but yeah, you'd never know now. That looks just the same as the others. So the only other mystery on this board at the moment is where does this fan go? Well, the first thing I'm tempted to do is try and clean this out, actually. Can we unscrew it? I'm not sure if there's a bolt or something holds it on the other side. And I assume it would have originally had four screws, not two. Um, how do you get it out? Does it come out from the underneath? Might just pull the board out, I think. So I've got the fan out here. You've got to lift the board out of the shielding, and then it comes out, obviously, underneath. Um, we'll clean around there with cotton buds. I'm going to go clean this up with some cotton buds. Um, but I think we need to extend the wires here. I don't know where it goes. I don't see anywhere to plug it in. So let's give this a clean. It goes with this label upwards as far as I can gather, because can you see, well it was, that's the way it was installed. It might not be the right way, but that's the way it was installed, and we'll just uh, clean each of the blades like this. Of course you could vacuum this first and then wipe over with cotton buds. And it's worth using a second cotton bud because as you collect the dirt, you know, this is getting really dirty and then you're just going to keep wiping the dirt around. So. Yeah, anyway, once I've gone around once, I'll then use uh, a couple of other cotton buds to make sure this is super clean. And of course, do a bit of this as well to go all around the edge there. Can't get that out now, it's stuck. There we go. 
uh, and then with a dry clean one but yeah that is uh, it's looking a lot cleaner now so the next thing I want to do is just quickly test this so if we just uh, strip the ends of the wires off here separate them a little bit and a 9 volt battery and if we just go see that yeah you can see it's working and it's quiet silent now I think, and I could be wrong, J22, I see some messy solder points there. So let me just uh, connect the power supply up. We don't have RAM in or anything here, so it's, it's not going to boot properly. I'm interested to see what we get with that RAM, actually. And, uh, yeah, nothing. Yeah, so hopefully you can just about see the meter there. The ground is on the right, and the left-hand pin is 11.5 volts. So, brilliant. At some point I might just get a JST connector so I can disconnect the phone, but you know what, it's kind of part of the board so we'll just solder it on. So I'll take this over to the mat, uh, I've got to remember, the ground is to the right. So you can see the bits of wire look <laughs> there, they're still there. So uh, yes, it's just got pulled off the other side hasn't it, the connections have broken. So we'll just see if we can uh, remove these. Yeah, sometimes you might be able to pull them like that one's pulled out, look. Let's see if we can do this one. Yeah, that one's a bit more stubborn, I think. It's probably because that one's the ground. So let's add a little bit more solder. And of course, the other thing you can do with things like this is try and grab it, uh, if I can. There's hardly anything to grab there, that's the problem. and then try and pull it out like that, there we go. So we've got uh, two nice clean holes. So I cleaned around here with a bit of IPA on this side as well. What I need to do now is find the best way to mount this actually. I think the wires went kind of up there like that. Yeah, I think it goes the other way up actually because, oh hang on, it's got nut positions on both sides. But yeah, this was the way that the where the dirt was on the board, so yeah, in theory I could mount it like that. Let's just rotate this all the way around here just to make the wire a little bit shorter because it kind of just looks crazy otherwise. Yeah, so I like that, you see. It's not going to interfere too much that uh, wire, is it? So I'll get one of these through and I'll get the nut on the other side. I'll report back in a minute when I've secured it. Yep, there we go. So the fan is secured and it was ground to the right. It's a bit misleading because the, some of the red has come away with the black part of the cover of the cable there. But if we just feed that through, it's pretty sturdy this wire actually. Yeah, it's quite hard to do this because the board is huge. Anyway, I'm holding it from the other side, just pressing the wires towards this slightly so that we don't get lots exposed on the other side. And we'll just add a little bit of solder to each and just push them again just for good measure yeah that should do it so we'll just clean the flux off around there there's quite a lot around that uh, ground point there but yeah it's going to be from manufacture while we're here and we have it on the mat I'll clean off this uh, sticky stuff here I'm guessing there would have been like a warranty label or something like that around here see it's really gooey so let's go test it I'll uh, reassemble it as best as I can I'm just waiting for a power supply so we can test the uh, 060 board out later um, but for the moment I just want to have a play around and see what works so the shield has a couple of kinks on the back you can see here where it has clearly been bent outward so we'll just try and uh, straighten this a little bit bend it like manually like that uh, and then just use the uh, flat nose pliers here to try and straighten it. Yeah, that's not looking too bad now. It's uh, still just a little bit out here somehow. That's not bad, actually. The other thing I'll do is any of these little twists here, I'm going to straighten them so they don't catch on the shell, because those will push it out of uh, shape. There we go. That's quite straight now, you can see on the back here, you can always just push it that way a little bit, but that is looking a lot better. 
yeah that is looking much better actually if you kind of just bend it a little bit like that you can see it's pretty flat and flush along there so let's get the board back in you should be wearing an ESD wrist strap when handling a board like this uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that fan go and when I say go I mean work not <laughs> fail the board still needs cleaning up because there's smeary fingerprints but anyway we've not really uh, finished this by a long uh, shot but I just want to get it back together and play with it. So let's get this drive back in. The uh, pin one marking is on the right hand side as I mentioned earlier. That's it. Uh, and it kind of, the cable will kind of, oh, let's move that one out of the way. It would be easy to damage this floppy cable because you can see it just uh, goes that way. I'm just wondering how that's wired that way. It's like wrapped around itself. Anyway, if we move it out of the way, yeah, this thing just fits flat like that and we just have the two screws here to hold it in. I haven't got two for there so if we uh, get the first one in just make sure that ID cable's not there you go caught by the uh, metal shield there and it isn't make sure it's flat there we go and do that side there we go it's okay I don't like how kept taut this cable is here but you can just lift it a little bit I guess like that Get the power supply back in. Do make sure you get that connector aligned properly, otherwise you will uh, feed a voltage somewhere else. It might not be too bad actually because, well yeah it would be. It, plus 12 here, you'd be connecting it to ground if you did it that way. And if you did it the other way, the ground and the 5 volts would be shorting. I mean they're going to short the other way as well, so the power supply might cut out, you might be saved. But anyway, do make sure that goes on as straight as you can get it. And that'll just uh, sit there for the moment. I won't screw it in just yet. So I might try a mod there. I might stick a cap on it. And I might also try feeding uh, through a diode. Because, I don't know how well you can see, just look closely. Let me zoom you. Yeah, I see like diagonal lines like this here. That has only appeared since I added the fan. So that fan is clearly introducing some noise. I know 3DO Kid was going to send one of these, you know, the chap that's given me this was going to send one of these, but I've just received one of these in the post. I'm tempted to stick it over the top of that and leave that there, but I mean, I could pull that off. You know, you can see it's very faded. That should be red and it's like a very, very light orange sort of colour. Um, and the blue should be a bit bluer, the green a bit greener and the yellow a bit yellower. Um, up here is okay, but then over here you can see there's some scratches and stuff. And you might not be able to see them, but on the very top edge there, there is as well as if someone's tried to pry that out at some point. Now, there are two little holes on the underside of the plastic shell that you can use to stick something through to push this off, but it'll mangle it as you take it off. Sometimes if you freeze this with freezer spray, these types of badges, and then very carefully push them to the other end, it will come off without uh, too much uh, of a problem. The freezer spray just kind of makes the glue go a bit, well, rock hard, so that it kind of loses its uh, elasticity, if you see what I mean, and it, it can make it a bit easier to take off. But I could, in theory, just peel this back, and I've done the same thing on my STFM and STE, with replacement badges there. For the 4 meg so you can see I could just literally stick it there yes it does stick up a little bit but it just means that bit of history is still under there so I might do that I don't know anyway we'll do that in a minute uh, I've got uh, Fate of Atlantis running here via the uh, scum emulator here I mean, just listen to this hang on just look around speech okay. and everything it's fantastic but something that just caught my eye, and I don't know whether you can see this for the light, just down here there's like a little something metallic, like a metal loop or a ring. Can you see that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I've tried to adjust the camera, I'm not sure you can... Yeah, you can just about see it. If you just look down here, there's like something metallic here, like a... A ring or something. I don't know. I don't know what that is. So I'm just going to carefully use this keycap uh, removal tool here and try and pull this key off. I think they've all been off in the past. I think someone's retro brighted this. Let's just see if we can pull it up. It'll be quite difficult to get this key up because it's a weird shape. 
Oh, I'm stuck under that one now, look. Yeah, there we go. So that wasn't clipped on properly, was it? And for some reason, the volume has just got really loud. I've noticed some intermittent, let me reset that. I've noticed intermittent issues where the volume is like one minute it's really quiet and then it's really loud. So there could be an issue with the sound. Um, have we got a clip missing there? Yeah, I think we have. That's probably what's wrong with that look. One half of that little clip down there is broken off. But in theory, if this is pushed into that clip there, like that, yeah, you could uh, put that back on without an issue. Anyway, I'm just going to get a cotton bud and just clean around there a little bit before we clip that back on. Anyway, let's try clipping that back on under there, like that. They're never easy to get back on these. This is easier when you've not got these other keys around it. Yeah, there we go. I just tilted it this way, you know, so I dealt with this side first, and then as you can see the bar go into position, I just pressed down here and then it's just gone back on okay. It's now got full travel. Before it was getting trapped because that piece of metal was stuck underneath there, so yeah, that won't have helped. The other thing I'll point out here for the Eagle Eye, this key was really crooked before. You know, it's, it's, it's still a little bit now. If you look at it, if you look at the line here, you can see on this corner here, it's going upwards a little bit. It was very crooked. That's another indication that's either had a knock, and you can do a little bit of this. You've got to be careful because you could break the plastic. But with a little bit of manipulation, of course, you could take it off and straighten it. Can you see that? That's almost straight now, that. Uh, but this is a common problem with STs as well. These keys up here can suffer with that. Can you see this end one? That's suffering with that a little bit. It's pointing up here near the top, and that one is. But then these ones here start to look a bit more straight. Uh, yeah, it's very common with the, let's say, the style of key. But you could do the same thing. You know, if I just uh, pull the lid off, you could uh, just grab the key and just give it a little twist like that. And if you do that with any of the ones that are, you know, that have had an impact and knock in the past. You'll find that, it, look, it's, it's pretty straight that now. That one's still pointing upwards a little bit. But you can get them almost back to good as new. But you can see the video uh, adapter here that 3DO Kid provided as well, which is just amazing. Um, in the next video, I'll cover some of the stuff to do with that. And from the fan noise, it's probably a bit obvious that there's more than one fan running in here at the moment. Let's just go straight into Nightmare. So yeah, initially, you may be a bit disappointed seeing things like this because you think, well, this has got an 030. You can hear there the sound's a bit different. The music is slightly different to the Amiga version. This uh, layout. But it plays just the same, if not a little bit smoother. Sweet. So there's lots of things I can't show you at this stage because there is a clock problem with this machine. But the area of the board where we fitted that resistor, that's where the clocks get split. You get one originating clock signal that uh, comes out. Let's just let that beats of rage. Yeah, the clock signal gets split three or four different ways. The trace that was cut was to the expansion port, I think, and it's a rec one of the recommended techniques to improve the clock signal a little bit, cut that trace. That's why that had been cut. But as you saw, we've reinstated it. There is still an issue though. Uh, and obviously one of the resistors was missing there. So you can hear we've got nice PCM sound here. This doesn't run as well as I expected it to do, to be honest. We choose, uh, let's go with Mandy. So you'll have seen Beats of Rage. It's uh, like an open source engine for, you know, it's very similar to Streets of Rage. But as you can see, yeah, the performance is not as good as I expected. It's a little bit on the jerky side. But this does not, in my mind, showcase what the Falcon is capable of. As you'll see in the next video. Yeah, so a little bit jerky, a little bit clunky. It's still impressive the size of the sprites and stuff. What's annoying with this is I'm using the jag pad, as you can see here. Uh, and I think it's just a single button. None of the other buttons do anything, as far as I can see. Yeah, you've just got that one fire button. So, yeah, you could argue that maybe this port needs updating 
to support this hardware better. Anyway, let me show you one or two other things. So the Falcon has its own version of uh, Raiden, as you can see. It's not as impressive as I expected it to be. I actually prefer the uh, Jaguar version of this, I think. It's just so hard. And it's nowhere near as smooth as some other versions, like the PC Engine, for example. I'm using the Jag Pad again. So yeah, this is just a demo, so it's not complete. I'm not sure how much of the game is in here, and it's obviously lacking uh, music in the background. Just turn that down to touch, it's quite loud. But you will see, hang on, that's a special effect, hang on. You will see just how many sprites this is capable of throwing around the screen and stuff here. It'd be really good if someone revisited this and finished this off, because it really is good. Wow, that's hard. Some of the stuff you get on screen, it just gets crazy. And I think there's some scrolling as well, a bit further on. I, think it, I don't think it just stays stationary like this, I could be wrong. Oh my goodness, this is a bullet hell shooter. And I'm sure you guessed you were going to see a port of doom. So this is just running at 16 megahertz, the standard Falcon 030. I think it needs the 14 mega RAM. I could be wrong, pretty sure it does. But as you'll see, this uh, works pretty well as well. Just considering it's at 16 megahertz, let's press the button. Using the jag pad here still. The nice thing with this port is you've got like a MIDI soundtrack, you know, handled by the audio hardware on the Falcon. I want to say MIDI, it's not probably really MIDI. You can connect a MIDI device up to get proper MIDI sound. But what I'm saying is you've got the music and sound as well. If you look at other ports of Doom, say for some of the Amiga hardware for example, because of the limited number of channels on Paula, you find you just get audio, you know, sounds, you don't get music. But if you listen to that, you've got music as well. So yeah, it is its performance great on the O30? Well, it's not as good as it could be, but it's not bad. It's not bad at all. It's way better than uh, my 1200 with an O20 running at 33, that's for sure. So yeah, a little bit jerky. You can see you got those little blue uh, things at the bottom there when you pick up some health there. That's quite a nice effect. But anyway, as you will see, oh, well, you may see, if we get the 060 running, it should run a lot better. Still, I think it's very impressive. And there's a port of Duke Nukem 3D as well, but I'll show you that in the next part. So as you can see, it's not great, it was never a great game this. And there are a few other racing games I'll show you in the next video that look a lot better and run a lot better. So yeah, the commercial games I've shown you here, the one or two that I've shown, don't really showcase the power of the Falcon really. It was capable of a lot more than these games demonstrate, I think it's fair to say. As you can see, this is a homebrew version of Bubble Bobble. It's, I think it's called Double Bobble. It's quite cool. You start off moving quite slow, but when you get the shoes to run around, you run at a fair speed. It's, uh, it's pretty good. And of course, you could play the ST version. I didn't show it, it does actually run. You know, you saw the title screen come up, but the game does actually work. It's, um, it's just a bit fast. What you can do is run something called Backwards 3, um, and it's like a TSR thing, so you can have that running in the background and you can use various key combinations to configure the system, you know, run 8 megahertz instead of 16, switch off and on the caches, and then older games for the ST and stuff run uh, a lot better, more normal, just like you were playing on an ST. And it goes without saying that the operating system, if you've used an ST or an STE, you'll be familiar with it. It's identical, menu options and things, you've just got higher colour depth. If we're going to uh, set video, you'll see we've got uh, different options here. You've got different colour depth, you can go up to true colour. And when they say true colour, I think it's a 16 bit, it's not 24 bit. Uh, that's my understanding. But you've got different uh, colour depths there, you've got 80 column or 40 column. You've got compatibility modes for the ST there, that's very cool. The current version of the uh, operating system I run here is TOS 4.04. .04. I think they probably shipped with version 4 though. 
uh, and everything it just looks and feels very very similar there's no option to enable or disable the blitzer this does have as I mentioned earlier a blitzer that runs at 16 megahertz and from what I understand that blitzer was put in there for compatibility reasons because if you've got the blitzer there it means you're compatible with all the STE stuff doesn't it the other thing I'll just quickly show you now this is up and running on a stock standard Falcon if I load that uh, F amp click OK we've got a little MP3 player now bear in mind we've got no acceleration or anything added to this it's a stock Falcon 030 hang on my mouse is playing up if we just click play it'll take me to a file dialogue can't play this for very long I don't even know where this music came from but there is a folder on there with some MP3s and if I click OK as I say, I may need to mute this pretty sharpish. As you can hear, we've got an MP3. So just fast forward on a little bit, you can hear that's crystal clear. So my understanding is that's using the DSP, the digital signal processor, and the 030. But you can play MP3 files as well on a native Falcon. That's just amazing. One more thing I think is worth pointing out. Cobalt is really useful utility to have. I spent some time, as you'll see later, copying various games and demos to the compact flashcard here, and I'll talk about how I did that later. But one of the problems I ran into when you try and use the you know the operating system here, I think it's called Gem actually the operating system. But when you use it to copy, say one folder to another, if there are more than say 255 files, you find that it just stops in its tracks and it looks like it's completed and it's, it's worked okay and then you go into the folder and you realize like lots of files are missing it stopped in its tracks it didn't complete the copy and this is also useful on an STFM and an STE I've had the same problem on those systems but I would have expected that that limits that bug or whatever it is to have been fixed now it might not necessarily be an operating system bug it could be something to do with a hard disk driver that's on here maybe when you install it you set you know you allocate a buffer size maybe when that buffer size is breached that's when it has the issue or maybe it is a bug in TOS I honestly do not know but what I do know is if you use this cobalt and you you know you've got a source window and a destination window and you set your folder where you want to copy it to and from and you do the copy it's like 20 or 30 times maybe even 50 times faster at copying it's really 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 quick but it completes as well even on crazy folders where you've got like 700 files or more within different folders within there subfolders it works so that's just a little tip for you so wrapping up here, I cannot thank William enough, this is just amazing, uh, it's uh, a number of weeks since I've had this system now and I've been using it an awful lot and I just love it, it's just such a powerful, awesome system, I love it, it's uh, probably the pride of my collection really. There are other things that people have given me, this is the other thing, I don't want to undermine or you know downplay the importance to me uh, of the things that have been sent to me from other people. Things like the A4000 board I got from Stephen Leary, I love that board, it's a prized, cherished part of my collection. The soldering iron I got from Dermot Sweeney, again, is something that uh, you know features in lots of my videos now, I use it all the time. It's a wonderful piece of kit and uh, you know each of these people I will uh, try and support however I can in future. As I said with this, I'm going to offer him sort of like lifetime free repairs really with this. The value of this, if the 060 can be made to work, you're probably looking around the £2,000 mark, and you th might think I'm crazy. I think that's a crazy price, personally. But if you look on eBay, the last few weeks there's been a few of them, a few, and one or two of them are sold around the £2,000 mark. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely unbelievable. As I say, I can't thank William enough. I'll post some links down below to his uh, Twitter um, and his website, check his website out if you like looking at game comparisons and things he does a fair bit of that where you see you know two or more versions of games compared side by side just in a you know a short uh, sort of video presentation there so there's still quite a lot to do in the next part we need to try and see if we can get that 060 board running we need to change the badge and uh, a few other things the video stuff i haven't uh, even though i showed you it working on the tv here the stuff to do in the next video with that and a number of other things the games and things I showed towards the end of this video kind of downplay the capabilities of this system as you'll see in the next parts so I do hope you found the video interesting thank you very much for your support thank you very much to everyone that posts comments my subscribers and patrons uh, and people that donate via coffee as well just buy me a coffee occasionally the links for those are down below 
thank you very much. I'll catch you in the next video.